Hello and welcome to Cover Story. I have with me today a special guest, a favorite guest, in fact, whom I have not had for a very long time. I have Mr. Mani Shankar Ayer, former cabinet minister and also a very prolific author. We are here today talking about your latest book, The Rajiv I Knew, India's Most Misunderstood Prime Minister. I think Mr. Ayer, very aptly put. I like the title a lot. Thank you very much. Well, the credit goes to my publisher who thought up the title. So let's give your publisher also some due. But uh, more than that, you know, I was also watching an interview, I think, of yours with Veer Sangvi at the launch. And he says that you're the last congressman standing who talks about Rajiv Gandhi. Not even his own family, is, uh, the kids, they just talk about Indira, Nehru, that's the legacy. They don't, there's yeah. a huge gap where Rajiv is. I think that is why I wrote this book. I was wondering whether the timing was right. Mm. Because Rajiv is too long ago to be contemporary. Right. but too recent to be history. Hmm. So I've, I think this book has fallen between those two stools. There is very little interest in Rajiv and his life, his problems, and what, and his, what he attempted to do. But it seems to me that if the Congress is to revive, it needs to go back to Rajiv and Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, and so anyway, I've written this. Was Rajiv a continuity of Nehru? Because Nehru was also, you know, in, whether it was on his economics or, you know, his uh, so-called vision of secularism. Would you say that? You see, uh, Nehru was a socialist, hmm. but he was definitely not a communist or a statist. He was clear in his mind that he was not going to do what Stalin, I'm talking about uh, the Russian Stalin, not the <laughs> Tamil Nadu Stalin. Uh, what Stalin had done was to collectivize agriculture. Mm. And agriculture constituted about 80% of our economy. And Nehru strictly left that to the private sector. Equally, it was the Bombay plan prepared by a set of industrialists mm led by J.R.D. Tata in the 1940s, who had recommended that the heavy sector of the industrial, of industrial India should be with the state, because the private sector neither had the financial resources, nor the technological capacity, nor the partnerships with Western countries that was required for building the heavy industry sector. And they recommended that consumer industries mm. should be left to uh, the private sector. And that is what the socialistic pattern of society, yeah, right. which was adopted as a resolution in Avadi in 1955, signaled. So therefore, to portray Jawaharlal Nehru as some kind of anti-private sector individual is to completely misunderstand his economic policy he captured the commanding heights of the economy by saying that the state would do what the private sector then could not do. And uh, so I think what, what Rajiv saw was that the very success of Nehruvian economics made it necessary to make adjustments in the program. And so Manmohan Singh is the first to acknowledge mm. that economic reforms actually started under Rajiv Gandhi. Indeed, as I pointed out in this book, the only year in which India has ever attained two-digit growth was in Rajiv's time in 1988-89, when he recorded 10.67% growth. I remember reading that. And I'm waiting for the BJP to come up with some spin on that one. But, um, you know, you also write in your book that part of the issue, that Rajiv uh, is, you know, he was very trusting in terms of his advisors. And they, and a lot of them were those he had inherited either from his grandmother or, uh, sorry, from his mother or, you know, the people around him are who, who let Rajiv down. If we go for controversy by controversy, whether it's the Shah Banu case, uh, you know, uh, who let him down there, IPKF, the decision to go there, the um, uh, uh, so, you know, all these uh, issues, you are saying each one he was misguided. A, what does that say about Rajiv? He's trusting. But a man who's led by his advisors is also doesn't make for a very good leadership model. You see, Rajiv was not, was a reluctant PM. Right. He had never prepared himself for that job. 
and it was Arun Nehru who ensured that the party had no alternative because he thought that since Rajiv was uh, a complete innocent, mm. he would become the pa behind the throne and he would be the Bairam Khan <laughs> to the infant Akbar. But the minute Rajiv got elected by the people, he then came into his own. Right. And he had a lot of ideas of his own. And his principles, his ideological principles, were all derived from Jawaharlal Nehru. He didn't know it himself, but he had absorbed those ideals in the family in which he lived, in the house in which he lived. And so he came with a ready-made agenda. And when Arun Nehru discovered that this guy was going to be no puppet of mine, he started implementing his own agenda, which was a very BJP type of agenda, a Hindutva type of agenda. And the minute Rajiv discovered that this was so, he had him expelled hmm. effectively from all his posts. And that is how, that is the origin of the National Front, which in a sense defeated him temporarily in 1989, November. So yes, Arun Singh was another who was so resentful about being removed from the post of permanent private secretary, sorry, uh, permanent secretary to, the parliamentary secretary to mm -hmm. Rajiv Gandhi, and kicked upstairs to become a minister of state in defense, that when he thought up this operation brass tax, and Rajiv restrained him because the Pakistanis were getting alarmed, and Rajiv had no intention of going to war with Pakistan. Then he disobeyed him, and so did uh, General okay. Sundarji. Yeah. But by common reckoning, General Sundarji was outstanding. He was yeah. supposed to be an absolutely brilliant man who was going to bring brain and brawn together as chief of army staff. And he betrayed Rajiv, and at that point, I said that in the book, I laughingly told Rajiv that next time he appoints a chief of army staff, he should give the guy an IQ test. And if the guy passes the IQ test, then he should not be made the chief of army staff. So people like that betrayed him. And I think he got very wrong advice on the Shilanyas. And I don't know whether it was Fotidar or Dhawan or a combination of the two who did it. But by that time, 1989, hmm. Rajiv had lost his self-confidence because there were so many political setbacks. And I have therefore revealed the Rajiv Gandhi there was with all his warts. Mm. But at the same time, I tried to bring out how unfairly he was treated by the media at that time and by public opinion at that time. And uh, we haven't mentioned you didn't either. Both of us yes. were the principal culprit mm. was Arun Nehru. And he did it because he thought he could control the prime minister. And the prime minister discovered that this chap is doing this, so he had him removed. So what more could Rajiv do? As far as the IPKF is concerned, I have quoted uh, J.N. Dikshit and then added, I have nothing to add. Because Dikshit says that everybody, everybody misled themselves their respective fiefdoms and the prime minister with regard to uh, Sri Lanka because they did not understand the fundamental fact mm. that the LTT was not ready to compromise and that they would fight for their Elam until as in 2019, they were, or 20, sorry, 2009, they were completely destroyed in a vicious attack on them by the Rajapaksa government. But how could India hmm. have done what Rajapaksa did? We couldn't have. And short of that, there was no way you could stop Prabhakaran from uh, doing everything, including giving cyanide pills hmm. to his favorite uh, aides uh, to have them commit suicide in the cause of Elam. And he killed far more Tamils than he did Sri Lankans. And he killed mostly mm. other f Tamil freedom fighters. So he was a very peculiar individual who should have been 
properly psychoanalyzed by those in intelligence, by those in diplomacy, by army intelligence, before they advised Rajiv Gandhi to accept a clause in the Jayavardhane Rajiv Gandhi agreement, which specified that if the Sri Lankans asked for it, hmm. then uh, military help for peacekeeping hmm. will be given. And don't forget hmm. that IPKF, which is a, an acronym that everyone uses, stood for Indian peacekeeping. peacekeeping Force. It was not an army that went in to attack anyone. Correct. But the LTTE started attacking them, and then our military incompetence was shown through the month of the crucial month of October 1987. It was, it was dreadful the way the Indian Army was unable to handle these people. And it was not till Calcutta came and Sundarji effectively was taken off responsibility for this that we began showing the strength of our armed forces. And that is the background under which this happened. So I don't think Rajiv's stars were okay, hmm. and I don't think his, his advisors, advisors <laughs> whom at least these advisors hmm. were of a decent kind, and he uh, sadly lost his self-confidence when he found himself under continuous and completely unfair attack by others, and that's when things started going wrong. Okay. I do believe... Hmm that uh, the election defeat of 1989 led to a lot of introspection on his part and that uh, he wouldn't have been far more careful about whom he listened to in the event of his really? coming out of the 1991 election successfully. But alas, he was assassinated. So to sum up, basically, I am not making excuses for Rajiv Gandhi. I am trying to explain what was the ethos and how, by being a good man, mm. he was unable to meet the maneuvering of very evil people who had largely been brought into the Congress in Indira Gandhi's time and whom he inherited from them. So this is not uh, how many ways do I defend thee? <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. It's not an attempt to cover up, okay. huh. uh, which but is the title explain. of your show. Uh, is no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an attempt to cover up. It's huh. an attempt to explain. Hmm. And in explaining, I hope I have succeeded in bringing out what a good man he was, what an outstanding visionary he was for the country and how his values and his ideals were totally in keeping hmm. with our freedom struggle, although today there would be no place for them in today's Modi's India. That is true. In fact, you also um, uh, write about how trusting he was, and one of the incidents which I found was uh, where he gave and uh, he met uh, Prabhakaran for breakfast. He asked Rahul to bring his bulletproof jacket, and he Actually, gave that. Actually, it was for dinner. For dinner. And he asked for it because he thought uh -huh. that he needed to get Prabhakaran on his side. And Prabhakaran had very cleverly hid what his ulti ultimate objectives were. He went further. Hmm. He also deceived General Dipinder Singh in Chennai when he met him and said, I'm not going to surrender hmm. the heaviest weapon I have to the ambassador or the local commander in Jaffna, I'm reserving it to surrender it to you because that is the proof of okay. my earnestness in going along with the accord. And we know how and that actually ended. actually for over a month, mm. although he was acting suspiciously, he was acting in accordance with the accord. It was when Dilipan died and then his uh, naval group mm. was captured and he had cyanide given to them so that they could commit suicide and not fall into the hands of the Sri Lankans. That trouble broke out. So who could have anticipated at that mm. time? And in the meanwhile, you have Sundarji saying it'll take me a week, at most two weeks, 
to finish these guys. Correct. And it, in actual fact, they outlasted the Indian Army by 20 years. Mm. So there was a comp everything that Sundarji was involved in, whether it was Operation Blue Star, Operation Brass Tax, yes. IPKF, mm. was a disaster. And yet he has the reputation of being the great general. He wasn't. He was. Uh, Mr. Yar, uh, you know, you, um, your equation with Rajiv Gandhi also I find very fascinating because you can see uh, whether, you know, you don't say it in so many words, but one can see the level of trust and the equation and you were one who did not hesitate to speak his mind, not to the media, not to Rajiv Gandhi also. So um, how would you, you know, he, he was very trusting, that is one of his fatal flaws, but uh, evaluate I him. I think that's wrong. You repeated this twice. He was not very trusting. Hmm. Obviously, you don't pick on somebody to advise you unless you trust them. Right. And you don't keep them with you until your trust continues. Hmm. And in the case of both Arun Nehru and Arun Singh, he dismissed them when he lost his trust in them. So he was not trusting in a naive way. Huh. He, he, he picked on people whom he trusted. And 90% of the people he picked, fulfilled his trust in them. His entire bureaucratic uh, apparatus, mm. they were devoted to him. Uh, the uh, political apparatus largely was with him. It was only two or three rogue actors who oh, betrayed right. him mm. and betrayed our country. And among them, I would hold Arun Nehru as the biggest betrayer. Arun Singh, uh, in a second position very distant to Arun Nehru and then I would say that he made a mistake in bringing in Dhawan because it politicized the PMO and uh, there was a grave mistake made by Gopi Arora mm. uh, which I've dealt with at length which in many ways was responsible for the Bofors fiasco but please note and you've not yet noted it mm. so I'm going to bring it into sure. effect on big issues like Shabano mm. and Bofors, the Supreme Court was seized of both. The judicial system was seized of both. But they took their time. Mm. And in September 19th, 2001, on the act which, re which uh, followed the Shabano judgment, huh. the Muslim Women Protection of Rights on Divorce, Act 1986, which was contested by Daniel Latifi, mm. a communist Muslim. The judgment came 15 years after his writ petition, and Rajiv had been dead for 10 years by then. But that judgment, which I've quoted at great length, says that he did not reverse mm. the 1985 judgment. What he did was to codify it. Uh. He brought the whole of that section of Muslim personal law into our civil law. And instead of the Qazi determining whether the Waqf board was doing its duty or not, he left it to the magistrate to make that determination. And if the state Waqf board hmm. did not do its function of maintaining the woman, then the chairman of the state Waqf board stood in danger of being imprisoned by the magistrate which is why for the last 25 years, okay. all Muslim divorce cases have been decided by that judgment hmm. of, on the act. The act continues to be valid, despite, I think, about a dozen non-Congress governments that have been in office, including this one. Why are they not repealing that act if it was so evil? The fact of the matter is that he found the right solution, but it was not endorsed until a decade after he died. And during the time that he was alive, he was attacked for it. And even now, mm. I find that men much commentary simply ignores what the Supreme Court finally decided in September of uh, 2001. As for Bofors, yes. you saw that the Delhi High Court mm. in 2004, February, simply announced that there wasn't a scintilla of evidence that the CBI had been able to produce after 4,000 days of investigation. And the Supreme Court, therefore, dismissed the review petition 
which uh, the Modi government had attempted to file. So in these circumstances, after the man has been vindicated by the judicial process, hmm. for us to go on saying Bofers. that he took money on Bofors and that he was appeasing the Muslims on hmm. Shabano is, I think, extremely unfair. And uh, therefore, I'm hoping uh -huh. that the information given here will actually appeal to journalists. But journalists are worse than politicians when it comes to <laughs> admitting their mistakes. The media will never admit its mistakes. And that is why the media has not played up the Supreme Court judgment of uh, 2001 on Shabano and the, and the High Court judgment of February 9, 2004 and then the Supreme Court judgment of November, I think, 2019. It hasn't yeah. played it up at all. Because also the fact is the Congress is not playing it up. Why is the Congress so apologetic of Rajiv Gandhi? They never, uh, they didn't make a big deal about this. If they did, media would have come at least, there would have been debates, there would have been, everybody said, okay, it's vindicated, move on. You know, even during Kargil when the Bofors guns were used, why didn't the Congress make a big deal of it then? They just, uh, are they apologetic of Rajiv Gandhi? I think that is why I'm marginalized. <laughs> well. The Congress, you're right, hmm. has not played these up as it ought to have done. And the single most important answer to Mr. Modi's repeated attempts at painting us as corrupt would be to point to the all the judgments, Correct. not only the relating to these two, but also relating to uh, 2G and so on and so forth. All the judgments mm. that have shown that the accuser has been lying and the defense has been completely Integrate, integrate, integrity. Which is why if Rajiv was here today, you know, we talk about the Nehru Gandhi legacy in the age of Modi. Uh, where do you see that legacy? And if Rajiv would have been around, how would he have countered it? Would he have gone on to this temple hopping spree? Would he have stood for his uh, Hindu credentials? Or would he have, you know, um, uh, entered into the religion debate at all? The only way I can answer it is by citing, as I have done in the book, a statement made by Rajiv Gandhi huh. in a so moto debate. That is, the government itself brought the issue up hmm. on secularism, which Rajiv initiated on the 3rd of May, 1989, in which he opened by saying that only a secular India can survive. But the next sentence is even more significant. He said that perhaps an India that is not secular does not deserve to survive. So that was his credo. And we would have seen that credo in action just now. He was, he piously believed in the Hindu religion. He did visit temples, mm. as for instance, when he made his 13 visits to Tamil Nadu. But he was always clear in his mind that religion is a private affair and should not become, and the state should mm. not have any religion. And there must be no discrimination based on religion. That is what his secularism was. So I think he would have opposed tooth and nail what is now being done. He would certainly not have approved of the Prime Minister of India functioning as the chief Hindu priest, as we saw on the 22nd of January. So he would have been I think very, very vocal about these issues. Also with regard to corruption, mm. after all, who was the one who got himself investigated by the Supreme, by the Swedish National Investigation Agency? It was Rajiv who asked the Swedes. So why would he have asked the Swedes? And when he asked in parliament, VP Singh, mm. to place all the files of PMO relating to Bofors on the table of the house. Have you ever heard of a criminal asking that all the evidence against him should be brought out in public and that too in parliament? The man was innocent. Hmm. That is why he could throw this challenge. And that is why VP Singh failed to pick it up. Yeah. Because he knew that there is nothing to indicate hmm. that Rajiv or his family had taken a single penny. And that is why after 15 years, of investigation, the CBI was not able to turn up any evidence against him. But okay. he couldn't say all this 
when he was prime minister because he'd taken an oath of secrecy. But okay, quickly, we are totally out of time. Uh, given the, you know, you, uh, what about his equation with your current allies of the Congress? You know, he was, you know, he had friends across party lines. Uh, how would he, you know, in terms of uh, Mamta Banerjee? The one, form? the one party line that he wouldn't cross was having an alliance with the BJP. And the That's Congress is the way. only party in India hmm. to have never, never, ever been in alliance with the BJP. So there is a clear distinction hmm. between the Congress of Rajiv Gandhi and right up to the Congress of Malik Arjun Kharge, in which, for us, the BJP is untouchable. So that continuity is there, for sure. Uh, I would have also watched you to bring out some of the major initiatives that he took, which I are also covered in this book. book. For instance, his, his mind-altering initiative on Panchayati Raj. Which you have been the flag bearer of. And uh, I, was, I was the amanuensis. Hmm. I was just putting down in words what <laughs> okay. his thoughts huh. were. And it was he who took a deep interest in this issue. And that fundamental change hmm. in our system, converting our democracy into a three-tier system and not a two-tier system, requires, I think, acknowledgement by the cover story. Thank you so much for coming on the cover story and we uh, wish you all the best with your next book and, uh, you know... Uh, that is the second volume of my autobiography, is the next book. Okay, so that will probably deal with the Rahul years and the Sonia no, years? No, it, it, obviously, but hmm. my political career hmm. long predates Rahul Gandhi. So most of it yes, is Sonia. about the period before Manmohan Rahul Singh. became pr prominent, yeah. Okay, on that note, thank you so much, Mr. Ayer. We wish you all the best and thank you for talking to us on Cover Story. Thank you. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.